Good evening. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. And welcome to the 2014 Legislative Briefing. I'm Susan Adams Lloyd, Chair of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. And on behalf of the entire UMAA and the university community, I'm so pleased that you've joined us this evening. As the Association Board Chair, I've had the opportunity to meet with alumni from around the state and around the region. And no matter our background, our life stage or location of residence, the common string that connects us all together is the great pride that we have for our alma mater. As a global community of more than 4, uh, 435,000 alumni, there are many ways in which we can contribute to the strength and well-being of the University of Minnesota. One of those ways is by being here tonight and by advocating and sharing your voice on behalf of the wonderful university, you will do great things. You have memories on campus, as I'm sure, as I do, you value the degree that you received and you care about the future of this great institution. And your voice is therefore an important one to hear. And in our current communication landscape, our voice is really a very powerful tool. And the clip, as we just saw earlier, shows there are important areas for improvement at our university. But in order to fulfill those needs, we need to tell that story. And we need to tell that over and over in many forums. Later in the program, we'll have the opportunity to hear from alumnus David Gillette about how we can make our story and our voice heard. Because together, our voices do make a difference. And I know many of you are here tonight because you have a passion for advocating for the university. And the Alumni Association would love to hear more from you. So please, look at the back of your program and in your packet for more information on how you can nominate someone for our 2014 Advocate of the Year. We take great pride in honoring our alumni and friends who do great things on behalf of the university, and there's no better time to do that than during homecoming week. So get the nominations in now before you forget, and we'll honor this individual as part of that celebration the week of October 16th as part of 2014 homecoming. We'll be celebrating 100 years before we move into the program, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge any of our alumni, board of directors, if you'd please stand here. We'd like to thank you for your time and talent that you share on behalf of the university. So. And as well, I'd like to also recognize our Alumni Association members. Members make our programs happen and events like this possible. So thank you for your continued support and membership. Now, it truly is my honor to welcome Richard Beeson, Chair of the Board of Regents, to the stage. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great evening. Susan, thanks very much. We were talking before, our, uh, before dinner and got reacquainted with David Gillette and his wife and found out we're from the same house district, and that happens to be a seat that is open. And that's a real opportunity for any of you who live in districts where there is an open uh, seat and a chance to, to shape and influence uh, the, uh, the legislator. Well, um, with more than 68,000 students on five campuses, plus research and outreach centers, area health education centers, and extension offices across the state, the University of Minnesota touches every Minnesota in a meaningful way. And I mean all 5.3 million of us Minnesotans. As the state's primary research institution, the university is the economic engine for Minnesota. You know that, I know that attracting key faculty and lucrative research funding that propels Minnesota's economy. But our number one priority is to provide the best education for students and position them to be successful in their next 50 years in the work world. Each year, the university system awards more than 15,000 degrees. These graduates are Minnesota's future workforce and modern, efficient facilities with research and learning spaces suited for 21st century innovation and industries, prepare them for the jobs today. With that in mind, I speak for the entire Board of Regents of the University 
express full support for President Eric Kaler's capital bonding request 2014. We're bolstering research on aquatic species in our waterways along the, around the state to enhancing classroom and research spaces in high demand science, technology, engineering, and math. And I might add, I'm partial to the bee research. You see bee sun maybe a few hundred years ago in <laughs> Scotland. Uh, we had something to do with taking care of those little, those little insects. Well, once again, your presence here is really appreciated, as is your support for the University of Minnesota. So, uh, without any further ado, please uh, join me in welcome, welcoming President Eric Kaler to the stage. Thank you. Imagine lecturing or learning in a room with that noise? That is the sort of clanging and banging that occurs in many of our buildings across the University of Minnesota system. And I'll tell you, those recordings are building. Yeah, that happens all the time in places where people come to learn, people come to work. 30% of our buildings on the Twin Cities campus were built 70 years ago or more. Across our campuses, it's about 25% of our space that was built before FDR was president. We're a great university, but our infrastructure is creaking and groaning. If it were your house in Minnesota, you would have fixed the pipes, you'd have replaced the windows. You'd have repaired the roof, and you'd have shored up the foundation. This upcoming legislative session is critically important for our students and our faculty, and we need to firmly and clearly make the case that for us to compete, learn, and lead in the 21st century, we have to have 21st century facilities. It's as simple as that, and it's why we're all here tonight. Right here and now, we're working on building our advocacy community, our legislative advisory network. Students, faculty, staff, alumni, donors, and our Board of Regents, thank you for being here. You've already met Chair Beeson. I need to put you closer to Marla the next time you're together with the bee thing. That's good. He's joined by Regents Devine, Frobenius, Johnson, McMillan, and Simmons. And I saw former Regent Ramirez here as well. Thank you all for your work for the University of Minnesota. <laughs> Chancellor Wood from UM Crookston, Chancellor Black of UMD, and Chancellor Limkuhl of UMR are here, as well as many of our system vice presidents, deans from the Twin Cities campus, and leaders of our faculty senate. There's also, importantly, a great showing of students here tonight, and that's a very powerful signature, uh, signal uh, to our governor and the legislature. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate our friends in the College of Education and Human Development supplied the iPads for us to use tonight, but together it all adds up to a chance for us to raise our voices so they can hear us all the way to the Capitol in St. Paul. That's just how the system works. If our elected leaders know that there's deep, broad, and statewide interest and support of our Capitol request, and if we act to express that, they will respond. So far, Governor Dayton has taken a very good step, putting us in a good position but it's just a position to start. He's funded a little over half of our request, and it's now up to us, with advocacy, with strong voices, and with a compelling story to move the dial and move the governor's commitment forward. 
Now, I know many of you had a chance to wander through the showcases that uh, were in the other rooms uh, tonight and learn about the elements of our request. I'm going to talk about them just a little bit. You remember HEPR. HEPR, an acronym, actually a pretty ugly acronym, that stands for Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement Fund. It's a mouthful, but it's an essential funding tool to maintain what we have. We need a state investment to refurbish 71 projects from Crookston to Morris, from Duluth to Rochester, and here in the Twin Cities. They might not sound exciting. They don't actually sound exciting. But they're really, really important. We need to replace water lines on our Morris campus. We need to upgrade restrooms, the McGraw Library and the St. Paul campus. And yes, there is a waiting line. We need wiring and septic systems, and we need elevators across the system. They're dramatic and sexy, not so much, but they're necessary, very much so. Three years ago, my wife Karen coined the phrase, Heeper is cheaper, and it's stuck. And it's stuck because it's true. It is simply cheaper to tackle the hole in the roof and the leak in the pipe today than it is to wait for real damage to occur. Right now, Governor Dayton has recommended funding only 40% of our $100 million HEPA request for those 71 renovations. And I know and you know that a $100 million request, that's a big deal. But we have more than that that needs to get done, and we cannot afford to wait to get to that next list while we only partially fund this list. I'm going to walk quickly through the rest of our request in, as I hope you saw from that video, we're not just in the construction business at the University of Minnesota, we're in the people business. And the story isn't so much about what those buildings are about, but about what happens to the people who are inside them. We're preparing the next generation of leaders for Minnesota. We're creating the next generation of inventions, of businesses, of cures and treatments and we need to do that in modern and effective space. If we don't do that, our graduates will not be as ready as they need to be for the next generation of challenges and to create the economy of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So let me show you quickly how our capital request will change that situation and why our request matters to Minnesota and its prosperity. And I have props. You saw in the video earlier the antiquated nature of Tate Laboratory. Tate is a truly historic building, but it cannot live in that past. Built in 1926, it's been home to six Nobel Prize winners, but it was built when movies were still silent and nobody had heard of a kid from Little Falls, Minnesota, named Lindbergh. 4,000 students passed through Tate each year, and there are roughly a thousand physics experiments, hence the glasses, that they use in our courses. But there's only one small experiment room to use to prepare those. Ceilings are crumbling, pipes are exposed, and we must transform Tate and its legacy to prepare graduates for the science careers that are critical to the future of our state and for employment in 3M, Ecolab, Medtronics, Boston Scientific, and many other places. Let's move to the Microbial Science Research Building on our St. Paul campus. For now, the governor is not supporting this project at all, and that's disappointing. Our expertise in plant pathology and fungal evolution is known worldwide. We're absolutely leaders in that field of science. And we possess unparalleled potential in microbial research, which has practical today applications in controlling disease. It's a faculty that drives industry partnerships, aligns with our land grant mission, and will enable us to compete successfully for federal grants. But it's not in the governor's proposal. Exercise, very, very important. 
our Crookston campus, as you saw, bursting at the seams. Since 2006, the number of students living on campus has doubled, with three new residence halls being built since then. The current rec center in Crookston, Minnesota, was built in 1930. My dad was three years old in 1930. New Wellness Center, which will have academic space, means non-athletes will be able to get into that building before 10 o'clock at night, which is when they can get in now, and it will enable us to offer healthier options for students, a better undergraduate experience, and a better life. And if we don't improve our lab facilities for three of our most important research areas, we won't be able to attract and retain the world's great scholars the scholars who are at the front lines of tackling some of the most important problems that threaten the state, the nation, and the world's well-being. One is the critical issue of aquatic invasive species in our lakes and rivers. You saw the makeshift nature of Peter Sorensen's laboratories in the video earlier. His lab is housed in a tractor garage built in 1911. Did we have tractors in 1911? It's a tractor garage. The water tank that feeds his, his uh, experiments was designed to pump 200 gallons a minute. He needs a pump that's 1,800 gallons a minute. It's for a research initiative that is critical to our nature, our natural environment, our tourism industry in Minnesota. We also need improved greenhouses for a rare plant collection and then there's the predicament in which Professor, Professor Marla Spivak finds herself. It's practically Shakespearean in its drama. To save the honeybee or not save the honeybee? That is the question. Marla, as you probably know, is a MacArthur Fellow and so an official and certifiable genius. So Marla, can you join me? She's among the world's leading experts on honeybees investigating the worldwide loss of honeybee colonies. In her work, when she opens a colony of bees, that's, yours. that's mine, look at this. She wears a bee veil. <laughs> you can just hold this, you know. That's okay. I can wear it. I wear it all the time. <laughs> and she uses a bee smoker, which disorients the bees so she doesn't get stung. <laughs> Do not try this at home. <laughs> and the campus is going to be smoke free, it's just not right yet. <laughs> now, where Marla really gets stung, thank you, thank you. Thank you. is by the inadequate nature of her lab facility. The space she uses was originally a honey extracting facility and it was condemned 18 years ago. So now she and her bee squad has to move laboratories and colonies from place to place on our St. Paul campus. She deserves our support. Finally, let me turn to our request for a new chemical sciences and advanced material building uh, at UMD. I know Chancellor Black feels very strongly about this project as do I. Last year, as part of the higher ed bill, the legislature mandated that the U increase the number of science, technology, engineering, and math graduates to help fuel the state's workforce. Now, it technically can't mandate that we do that, but we agreed that that's an important idea for us. But UMD is an important part of doing that. But because of limited space, 150 qualified STEM degree applicants were denied admission because the campus lacks lab and learning spaces. We need to meet that demand. The number of undergraduates majoring in chemistry and biochemistry at UMD has increased nearly 40% over the past seven years. New building will help increase enrollment by 250 undergraduate students and 50 graduate students. Unfortunately, Governor Dayton didn't fund that project at all. 
So we have to work with him and the legislature to see the value and impact on our economy and our workforce in this state and particularly in Northeast Minnesota. So in closing, here is the hard math and the simple politics of where we are. The governor and the legislature has received requests for bonding funding of more than $3 billion. Transportation, community centers, higher education, $3 billion. When you look at what's politically possible, the idea is that the bonding bill this year will probably be a total of about $850 million. There will be winners and there will be losers in this conversation. If we don't make our voices heard, if we don't articulate the importance of the University of Minnesota, if we don't make it crystal clear that this university and these facilities matter to us, matter to our communities, and matter to the future of the state of Minnesota, there are plenty of people willing to take those dollars. And that, my friends, is why we're here tonight. You are the leaders of this effort. Your voices will be heard clearly. Your ability to communicate with your neighbors, your colleagues, your coworkers about the importance of what we're doing and about the importance of an investment in the University of Minnesota is critical. So just like those pipes that drowned me out at the beginning of my comments, you need to drown out other voices and you need to articulate loudly and clearly in support of the University of Minnesota. And I thank you for being here tonight and for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler, for that informative and uh, certainly entertaining summary of the capital request. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Smariga, and I am the Legislative Advocacy Coordinator for the University of Minnesota. As the Legislative Advocacy Coordinator, my job is to provide training and resources to the university community so that students, alumni, faculty, staff, parents, and supportive community members can meaningfully engage in the legislative process. And the way that I define meaningful legislative engagement is simply taking the time to tell one's personal story to legislators and elected officials. Specifically, telling the story about how the U impacts one's life, one's community, and the state of Minnesota as a whole. Because when you raise your voice for the U, you bring policy decisions to life and inform lawmakers about the real world impact of the decisions they make at the Capitol. And when policy decisions are closely tied to the real world, democracy works. So it is up to us as constituents to take the time to reach out and tell those who represent us about what matters to us and therefore do our part to support the 2014 capital request. And ultimately, ensure the University of Minnesota remains a shining example of teaching, learning, and research. Now, the really good news here is that just by being here tonight, you have some really good stories to tell. Many of you in this room stand to gain directly from the classrooms, research facilities, and other improvements outlined in the capital request. But even if you won't be taking a class or doing research in these facilities, tonight you have met individuals who will. You have heard about how vitally important these projects are firsthand. What a wonderful perspective to pass along to those who represent you in St. Paul. The other piece of really good news is that reaching out to your local legislators can be simple 
and does not need to take much time. And just to prove how quick and easy advocacy can be, we are all now going to do a little activity together. So, in order to prepare, I'd like all of you to grab one of the postcards, the maroon and gold postcards, that's at the center of your table. Also grab a pen or other writing utensil, whatever you're most comfortable with. And before you actually get to writing, here are some tips on the four essential elements to really any communication with a legislator or elected official. And those four elements are, number one, clearly identify your issue of interest and only cover that one issue of interest at a time. So for many of us here tonight, that will be the capital request. Number two, identify yourself and your personal connection to the issue. Number three, be specific about the action you are requesting. What is it that you would like your legislator to do? And finally, a very important piece, thank your legislator for his or her support. A positive, grateful tone certainly goes a very long way. So just as an example of what those four elements might look like in postcard form, here is an example of a postcard that I wrote to my State Representative Sandra Mason. Dear Representative Mason, I urge you to fully support the University of Minnesota's 2014 capital request. I am an alumnus of the university and also a current staff member. I want to make sure that the U can continue to enrich the lives of others the way it has enriched mine. Thank you for your service to our district. So in just those four sentences, I covered all four of those basic elements. So now what I would like is for everyone in this room to do exactly the same. So we timed this out back at the office and I think that you can do this in four short minutes. So your four minutes begin right now. Okay, four minutes is up. So obviously if you, you have not completed your postcard, Feel free to do so by the end of the night. But I would have a special guest who I'd like to invite to the microphone really quick. Mr. Matt Forsty is a student leader here on campus. Matt is the president of the Minnesota Student Legislative Coalition. And he has been a tireless advocate for the university. And he is passionate about student civic engagement and student advocacy in general. So I just thought I'd pull Matt up here and have him read his postcard. So let's hear what he came up with. All right, come on up. Okay, here's my postcard. <laughs> Dear Senator Senjum, I am writing you today about the U of M's 2014 capital request. As a student, I experience the return from completed bonding projects every day. I participate in active learning classes at the Science Teaching and Student Services Building and watch my friends search for a cure in the Biomedical Discovery District. This year, the U's plan will bolster our status as a top tier STEM institution and refurbish dec decades old buildings. I urge you to support the university's 2014 capital request. Sincerely, Matt Forsty, Class of 2014. Excellent. Wow. Well, thank you, Matt. You nailed that. Good job. And uh, thank you to all of you. Now, when you are finished with those postcards, please place them in that little empty bread basket in the middle of your table, and we will be collecting those and turning them in. Um, so your advocacy efforts for the 2014 legislative session have already begun. So good job. But... Even though they've started already, your work is not quite done. The real work begins after we head out uh, tonight. So, yes? Yes. Um, the question was, is there a written list of representatives and senators in this hall? 
Um, if you have not had a chance to visit one of the stations ahead of time to get your legislator's contact information, um, you can find that very contact information on the Legislative Action website. So legislative-action.umn.edu. Good, excellent question. So as I was saying, going forward, there is a homework assignment that everyone in this room has. So the very first piece of that homework assignment is to sign up to become a member of the Legislative Action Network, if you have not already done so. This is an opportunity for you to stay informed with what's happening at the Capitol, to learn about how that affects the you, and more specifically, learn what you can do about it. So if you have not already done so, please sign up at legislative-action.umn.edu, click on things you can do, and click on join the Legislative Action Network. And the second and final piece of your homework for the 2014 legislative session, and it's just one more, is to complete at least two of the following activities by the end of March. Two of the following activities by the end of March. Everyone in this room here tonight. The first option is to follow at UMN Gov Relations on Twitter and retweet advocacy messages. The second option is to use hashtag UMN Proud to share why you love the U. Now you'll notice those first two options are Twitter related, and that's because legislators really like Twitter. And you know what, if they like it, we like it too. And then the last three options are write an email or letter to your legislator, give your legis legislator a call, or meet your legislator in person. And that can be at an in-district meeting. A lot of times legislators will hold public events back in district, or it can mean going to the Capitol in St. Paul. Many of the students in the room here today will be a part of the Support the U Day this year. That'll be a great opportunity for you to have some of those meetings. So again, that's your homework assignment. I hope that you follow through, complete that assignment. And if you're feeling a little bit rusty uh, when it comes to your advocacy skills, don't worry, help is here. There, for practical tips on how to write those letters, make those phone calls, or arrange in-person meetings, you can go to legislative-action.umn.edu and click on tips and assistance. You will also find on the legislative-action.umn.edu site my personal contact information. And feel free, I am here to help support the community. Any questions you have or guidance you need, um, by all means, send me a message. Excellent. So the very final thing is just to reiterate how important it is to follow through and take action, complete two of those pieces of the puzzle. Because as you saw, the capital request is a fantastic opportunity to make a step forward at the U and to support this very great institution. So we are counting on you. Thank you so much. And now for the fun part, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Many of you probably recognize David Gillette or are familiar with his work as a special correspondent and commentator working for Almanac, Minnesota's longest running public affairs show, and Almanac at the Capitol, which airs during the legislative session. David specializes in using illustration and cartoons to help explain the complexities of the legislative process, and, you, and his unique blend of reporting and storytelling has earned him seven regional Emmys for on-camera commentary. Please join me in welcoming a proud alumnus of the University of Minnesota, David Gillette. I don't know if I look like that headshot. Um, thank you, President Kaler, for aiming that smoke device away from my laptop. <laughs> I was concerned I wasn't going to have anything to present up here. So as you heard, my name is David Gillette. I work at Twin Cities Public Television, and I am a proud graduate of the University of Minnesota. Um, one other thing I always like to mention about my tenure at the U is as you're going to see tonight, my presentation does have a lot of cartoons and illustrations, 
and this is a big part of what I do professionally these days, but I actually got my start as a, I guess I'll do air quotes, as a professional cartoonist, as someone who's paid to draw right here at the U working for the Minnesota Daily Student Newspaper. I did a comic strip called Last Semester that was hilarious and insightful and brilliant. <laughs> and I found today no one remembers it, but it did happen and it happened here at the U. I wanna tell you a little bit about how I've been spending the last few years of my life. For about the last six years, I've been given a really unique opportunity. And now as you've heard, I work on two television programs, Almanac, our Friday night public affairs show, and Almanac at the Capitol, which airs just during the legislative session. And this has given me the opportunity to up close, with my own eyes, observe the Minnesota legislature in action. And I think my vantage point is unique because I'm not a lobbyist, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything, I'm not, a, I'm not an elected official, I'm not trying to drive policy. I'm sort of a reporter, but not really in the traditional sense, and I'm sort of an analyst, and not really in the traditional sense. I really just have a lot of time to watch what's going on. And what I've tried to do with what I've learned is I've tried to put a lot of that on Twin Cities Public Television, on the illustrated pieces that I do. But tonight, I'm going to try something brand new something I've never done before and I have no idea if it's gonna work. I'm gonna to try to condense a lot of what I've learned into one presentation and present to you David Gillette's Rules of Minnesota Politics. Now I should say, for those of you in the room who spend a lot of true time at the Capitol, this might be pretty basic, but I'm hoping for those of you who are just right on the outside and really curious about how this place works, this will sort of give you a roadmap to some of the dynamics. So let's start right at the beginning. If you haven't figured it out already, you will very quickly. St. Paul is actually a very small place and the capital is a small place. It's the type of place where your individual actions are noticed, your personality is noticed, and how you behave is noticed. If you go to the capital and you're a jerk, people are gonna know you're a jerk. If you're polite and friendly, people will remember you as polite and friendly. But people will notice you as an individual, and as you get started on this process, I encourage you to remember that. So let's talk a little bit about the legislative session. Now as you know, the legislative session is a finite amount of time. It doesn't happen all year, luckily for folks like myself. And yet, every single year, I see something like this. I call it the marbles in the cookie tray rule. I don't know how they, how they orchestrate this, but every single year, the work that they set out to do seems to inevitably expand to fill the time they've set aside for it. And I tell you this because about three-fourths of the way through this legislative session, something's gonna happen. You're gonna hear legislative leaders come out and say, you know what, things are going so smoothly this session, I think we might wrap up a little bit early. And I know they're gonna say this because they always say this. And maybe they're right, anything can happen, but when, when they do say that, I want you to remember this slide right here and remember what I told you, because my money's on the cookie tray. I've seen it many times. This one breaks my heart just a little bit, but it's the truth. When you turn on your TV and you watch the floor debates on television, on Twin Cities Public Television, about 90, 95% of the time, what you see in those floor debates is actually political theater. A lot of the big decisions have already been made, and we'll talk about where in just a little bit. But I tell you this because one of the important rules of surviving a legislative session is focusing your energy in the right place, knowing where the important conversations are taking place. Because we all have limited energy, and if you don't focus your limited energy in the right place, there's a serious chance that you'll be facing burnout. You need to have stamina. Remember, those marbles are expanding across the cookie tray. One more rule of survival. And this is specifically for those of you directly involved in the policy work. It is very, very important that you do not tie your personal ego or your sense of self-worth to the outcome of any individual legislative session. Because politics is fundamentally an unpredictable thing and no one ever knows completely where it's going. We'll come back to why this is so important in just a little bit. So those are some of the really basic rules. But now let's get a little more specific. You obviously have a legislative agenda, you have things you want to accomplish, and how do you do that? Well, here's a good first step. You need to find your champions. Politics really is a personality-driven game. For any big issue you see in the news, you're gonna have one, two, three lawmakers who really have become the voice boxes, the faces of that issue. And if you can find a respected lawmaker or respected lawmakers at the Capitol who are willing to make your cause their cause, you're in an enormously powerful position. But, how do you do that? It's pretty straightforward, how do you do that? Well, to answer that question, I have to back up just a little bit and talk about the people who are elected. There are 201 lawmakers in St. Paul, that's not counting the governor, those are the elected officials in the House and the Senate. And if you look at these people, if you look at their biographies, you're going to see something pretty remarkable. You're going to see that they are mechanics, they are lawyers, they are doctors, they are stay-at-home parents, they are teachers. They're what we largely call in Minnesota, average Joes. 
Now, to be fair, I need, I need to say this out loud because I know many of you already know this. The Minnesota legislature is not as diverse as it needs to be to reflect all the communities in Minnesota. But still, to a remarkable extent, you don't have to be a millionaire to hold office in Minnesota. The people in the legislature are a lot like the people in this room. They are average folks. Except that they all do have one defining characteristic that may set them apart from the rest of us. And it took me a long time to figure this out, but I think it's very important. And I call it the projector effect. At some point, everyone who holds elected office woke up one morning and said, you know what, I can do that. I may be this person over here today, but I can be this person over here tomorrow. It's like they're projecting this image of themselves on the wall and they wanna grow, they wanna serve, and they wanna become this person. And they believe that they can do it. And I think that's a very admirable quality. So back to the question of how do you find your champion? Make one yourself. Build it from scratch. It's very possible. I see this happen every day. Remember, there are over 200 people who want to become this projection of themselves. They want to serve. They want to be bigger. And you, as the University of Minnesota, have a lot of the tools that they need to accomplish this. You have awards. You have speaking engagements. You have boards and committees. You have all the things that you use to flesh out a resume and to help them become the projection of themselves that they want to be. And you know what? When they get there, there's your champion. Just so it's said out loud, you're obviously going to need champions on both sides of the aisle. We're often told that Minnesota is a blue state, but the Minnesota legislature goes back and forth. The governor's office switches back and forth. The House does. The Senate not as frequently, but it has recently as well. And you need champions on both sides of the aisle. So how do you do that? That's a little more complicated. I'll give you one big hint. In the Minnesota legislature, being in the minority is really boring don't have a lot to do. You have constituent services and you have to respond to what the majority party is saying in the press conferences, but you frankly have a lot of time just kind of waiting to see what the majority party is going to do. That's an opportunity to do some champion building right there. Just a little hint. And when things change back the other way, you'll be well positioned. All right, so you've made your champions. What's the next step? It's time to set out some dominoes. I consider this the, uh, the repetition rule. Unfortunately, the pursuit of the common good is not always a highly cerebral exercise. A lot of times, it is marketing, it's branding, and it's repetition, which are complex professions, but I'm focusing on the repetition. This is what you have to do now that you have your message. You have to start to repeat yourself ad nauseum. You have to say it again and again and again and again. And after you've said it 500 times, after you've talked to every single lawmaker in the building twice, you probably only have to say it 500 more times before people start to hear what you're saying. Repetition is really key. And I say this because when a law, a bonding request, whenever anything passes in Minnesota, you see the vote on TV and you think it happens like that, but this is actually what's happening right here. The dominoes are tipping, and every one of those dominoes has been carefully set up along the way. And we all know what happens if you, if you miss even a few dominoes. You're not gonna get the result you want. So let me back up just a few steps. I just encouraged you to start repeating yourself again and again, but I do want to make a note about, about volume. You at the U are a big institution. You guys are giants. You have a big footprint. When you move around, people notice. I mean, look, I put some jet fighters in here. They can't even take you down. You're massive. And as a big institution like that, you can obviously generate a lot of noise. If you want to, I bet if you needed to, you could put 1,000 people on the steps of the Capitol tomorrow. But here's one of the ironies of St. Paul. The best way to be heard in St. Paul isn't always to make a lot of noise. If you really want to be heard in St. Paul, here's the secret. Whisper it into the corner like you don't want anyone else to hear. That's how you get people's attention. And I see this every day. Any given day of the legislative session, you'll have people out there with the signs yelling. Everybody knows they're, they're there. But that's not driving the conversation. Where people want to be is when Speaker Thiessen is whispering with President Kaler over on the side of the room. That's the conversation they want to hear. That's where decisions are being made. So the question I have for you is, how do you build the trust to be a part of these conversations, and how do you get closer to these conversations? All right. I don't know if this one's too gruesome for the room or not, but I had fun drawing it. This is the zombie rule. It's very hard to truly kill an idea in politics. And that's actually good news because you do have a legislative agenda. You have things you want to accomplish. But if your game plan looks like this right here, it's a simple linear progression, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and we're gonna reach the goal, you're in trouble because you're susceptible to any given roadblock. 
Any small little obstacle is going to derail your effort. And, you know, I've been in a lot of committee meetings where I've been sitting with lobbyists and the bill that they've been fighting for is literally going down in flames before their eyes. And you'd think that would be a panic moment, but really the good ones and the ones who really understand it aren't worried because they're already doing this in their mind's eye. They're planning the next step. They're saying, well, you know what? There's other obstacles out there that maybe I can use to my advantage. Maybe I'll ricochet it off that other committee, or maybe I'll tack it onto the omnibus bill, or maybe I'll get the minority party on board, and when the House flip-flops again, I'll, I'll run it in that way. They're strategizing, and a good legislative approach tends to look like this. You have plan A, you have plan B, you have plan C, and if none of those work out, you're flexible enough to come up with more plans on the fly. Because ultimately, the game that we're playing here is shoots and ladders. I think we all remember that from when we were kids. When you're playing shoots and ladders, it's easy to get preoccupied on where you are on any given space on the board, especially in relation to your opponents. But the thing we forget about shoots and ladders is that if you're persistent and you play long enough, you're going to reach the end of that game. You will make it to the end. Here's an, I want to do a uh, chart today because I knew it was going to be at the U. And if you look, <laughs> I love scatter charts, but um, if you look at any given legislative effort, the really big ones, you can make a chart sort of like this. The horizontal axis here very deliberately is years. I didn't put months or one legislative session, and ideas have highs and lows. They go forward, they move backwards, and it looks like kind of a scattered approach, but over time, if you average these out, if your ideas have merit and you present them honestly and openly, you tend to see something like this, a curve up. I saw this most clearly in my own experience when the legacy amendment finally passed. They'd been working on that thing for over 20 years. Senator Bob Lassard, the old trapper as they call him, had introduced that thing when I was just a kid, and over time, highs and lows, the idea came and went, and finally, it passed. So earlier in the presentation, I showed you this and encourage you not to tie your personal ego to the rise or fall of any legislative session. Because even though there's this big thing in front of you, there's this big rock that seems so important, there's a longer game at work. It's just one of these little dots on the board. And you do not want to tie yourself to such a volatile enterprise, believe me. Because remember, the ultimate rule of politics, which I did not come up with myself, but is very true, is that you want to survive to fight another day. Now, to wrap up here, I want to try to warn you about one of the big pitfalls I've seen in public life. Try to warn you and hopefully you can avoid it. And I call it this guy right here, Mr. Grumpy Face. <laughs> this guy has allowed himself to get a little bit cynical. He says things in his mind like, well, the system's broken. It doesn't work. There's no hope. We'll never figure it out. Well, you'll notice in my entire presentation tonight, I've only been using drawings, but I do want to use one written out sentence, and I'm going to put it up now, because this is what I've learned in St. Paul. <laughs> it's true, we live in an incredibly open and transparent system. You don't have to be a millionaire. You can run for office in this state. You can be an elected official. I met Chris last year at the youth legislature. I'm going off script now, but I met you in the lobby again, Chris. He can run for office someday, and he probably will, and he can do it. And I, you're not a millionaire, are you, Chris? Okay, you don't have to be. And the reason you don't want to pout, the reason you don't want to become a cynic is because ultimately politics is a game played by optimists. Remember the island? If you're a cynic for too long, you'll end up being this guy right here. You'll lose your opportunity to influence the system. And luckily, I think there's a very easy trick to avoid that pit. And that's simply to remind yourself just how lucky you are. If you're in this room tonight and you're about to get engaged in a legislative session, chances are you have three things going for you probably have your physical health, you have the ability to do it. You have a job that supports you, allows you to put food on the table and still participate in the debate. And maybe most importantly, at some point in your life you've probably had a teacher or a mentor or a friend who's opened your eyes to a cause that you believe in so strongly that you're willing to fight for that. And if you have all three of those things, you are very lucky. And as we all know, not everyone in this world is as lucky as those of us in this room tonight. So if you find yourself approaching the pit, this is where I'm really going to stretch the analogies all the way to the breaking point, I want you to think of eggnog. Because you know when you're drinking eggnog, and you think you've drank all the eggnog, and then you set down the glass and you wait a minute, and then by some miracle, th there's more eggnog there. There's a whole other sip. Where did that come from? It just coagulated off the edges. If you're finding yourself out of eggnog, set the glass down for a while. Take a vacation. I just came back from the Virgin Islands. It's lovely this time of year. Take a break. Recharge the battery and maybe there'll be that last sip of eggnog, just what you need to stay on the optimistic side of things. Because I have found that over the long run, over the course of years, it's the folks who approach this process with a sense of optimism, a sense of humility, a sense of honesty, and a sense of goodwill, those are the ones who over the long haul tend to trend better. 
And that's where you are tonight. We're about to launch yet another legislative session, put another dot on that chart, and you sit to hear, here tonight as the lucky ones. And in that luck, there is incredible power. And I encourage you to use it wisely. Thank you very much. Wow, that was absolutely enjoyable, David. Thank you so much for sharing your talent with us tonight. I'd also like to thank President Kaler and each of our representatives that were at the Capitol request stations tonight for sharing the value of each of these projects. This legislature will convene February 25th, and we will call upon you again to speak up for our university. Remember to visit legislativeaction dash uh, legislative-action.umm.edu to learn more. Thank you in advance for helping us make this a world-class institution. Together we can make each of the priorities a reality. In fact, one success of a past capital request that we will get to enjoy soon is Northrop. And I encourage you to attend one of the events planned this spring at Northrop Northrop's grand opening, and that is the University of Minnesota Alumni Association annual celebration on April 26. We are so excited. A live performance of A Prairie Home Companion with Gar Garrison Keeler. And finally, a special thanks to each of you for attending our briefing tonight and building the relationships with your legislators throughout the year. David, you gave us some excellent points on how we can do it, and I feel so empowered and excited to take that plan to action. You'll receive an email invitation to complete a short survey, so pay attention to that when it comes out about tonight's event and the program. So if you would please give us some feedback, we always appreciate it. We want these sessions and events to be the best that they can be.